I'm sorry, we're a little late today. We're trying not to make that a habit. Uh, I have a couple of, yes? A little late? Are you hungry, Matt? No, I already ate. Did you have I a snack? wolf down a burrito because I was expecting this a lot earlier. Anyway. Well, I apologize. And now I feel like one of the people on that cruise ship. Oh, okay. That's an, that's an overshare to kick us off. Uh, I have a couple of things at the top. Uh, Secretary Kerry will travel to Berlin and Munich, Germany from January 31st uh, to through February 2nd. In Berlin, Secretary Kerry will meet with senior German officials to discuss our ongoing bilateral cooperation, as well as pressing international issues. In Munich, Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hegel will participate in the 50th Munich Security Conference. At the conference, Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hegel will underscore the United States' commitment to our strong transatlantic relationship and our work to promote peace, democracy, and prosperity within the region and beyond. While in Munich, Secretary Kerry will also hold a series of bilateral meetings, uh, which we will provide more details uh, to you uh, as soon as uh, that becomes available. Uh, I also wanted to uh, note that we remain deeply concerned about the ongoing lack of freedom of expression and press freedom in Egypt. The government's targeting of journalists and others on spurious claims is wrong and demonstrates an egregious disregard for the protection of basic rights and freedoms. We remind Egypt's interim government of the need to permit an atmosphere that enables rights and freedoms to be exercised by all Egyptians without fear of intimidation, repercussion, and de detention. This is essential for any sustainable transition. Let me be clear that the United States places great freedom on a free, a great, great value on a free press. We are alarmed by reports today of additional journalists facing charges, including the Al Jazeera journalists. Any journalists, regardless of affiliation, must not be targets of violence, intimidation, or politicized legal action. They must be protected and permitted to freely do their jobs in Egypt. We remind the Egyptian government publicly and privately that freedom of the press is a cornerstone of democracy, and we urge the interim government to implement its commitment to this freedom. We strongly urge the government to reconsider detaining and trying these journalists and reiterate that they must be afforded all accordance of the due process under the rule of law. Finally, uh, we condemn in the strongest terms the attack on a Russian diplomat and his wife in Khartoum, Sudan. Uh, yesterday, we wish both victims a speedy recovery. With that, let me turn it over to you, Matt. Um, I just have one brief one on sure. the trip. Who in Berlin is he going? Which which senior German officials is he going to be seeing? Uh, let me uh, make sure that those have been confirmed. He'll of course see the foreign minister. I believe he'll also see the chancellor and the president. Uh, but uh, let us venture to confirm that th all those are final before we okay. report that. And back then, to you. Uh, and then in Munich, do you have any uh, any idea any idea of who the bilats will be with? Uh, they're still being finalized, but uh, we may have more to tell you today, or if not, by tomorrow, given we're leaving tomorrow. So, unless anyone has something else about the trip, I want to start with Syria. Okay. Uh, trip. Trip. No, Syria. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, you will have seen probably, most likely, I hope mm -hmm. at least, um, Mr. Brahimi's press conference. Yes. Or you know what he said. I do. In it, in it he said that uh, he didn't expect there to be any substantive progress at this current round of talks, which leads me to ask, is this, do you share this view? And if you do, what was the point of it at all? I mean, I understand the importance of an ice-breaking uh, get together, but seriously, couldn't this? Have, if, it, if that was all it was supposed to be, you know, couldn't they have gotten gotten that done over, you know, tea or something someplace at considerably less expense? And which brings me to my next point: is who is paying? Is the United States government paying for the Syrian opposition delegation's travel expenses? Uh, on that last question, I, I don't have any information on that. I'm happy to check on it. Uh, obviously, you know how strongly we support the Syrian opposition. In terms of what the purpose is, uh, we've said from the beginning that the purpose was to begin a process uh, of putting in place a transitional governing body. We never expected that to happen overnight. Obviously, it hasn't. Uh, and in his press conference today, uh, as you mentioned, Brahimi uh, said he did not expect uh, for there to be substantive uh, developments by the time they depart on Friday. Uh, what he also said is that he expects they will come back together. So what's significant about this week is this is the first time that the regime and representatives of the opposition have sat down together. They've talked about humanitarian uh, needs. They've talked about uh, the Geneva communique. And we expect that conversation will continue when they reconvene. What 
didn't they did that last week in Do in uh, Montreux? That is true, but these are difficult issues. They're challenging issues. Right. Uh, we didn't expect it would be a simple tea ceremony. We expected it would take hours and days of discussions right. well, and negotiations. I, but I understand that, but it was presented in Montreux that it was a sub substantive development that the two sides had even sat down together. And now he says, in the, in the same room, and now he's saying that he doesn't expect any substantive development at all. So it just I, I can't. What is it that you're that the United States, for its part, is hoping to see out of this? Is it if there is, in fact, no progress at all towards a transition government, as appears to be the case, have you scaled your sights down a little bit lower, and is it now mainly focused on uh, the humanitarian aspect, opening up homes and other no, it, places? No, we have not, and neither has Joint Special Representative Brahimi, and he has repeated many times that the goal remains putting in place a transitional governing body. It is a good sign that they began that discussion this week as part of the negotiations and as part of the meetings uh, in Geneva, and we expect that will continue. So uh, they discussed that today, and we expect that will continue to be a focus of the agenda. All right. uh, and then <clears throat> I just want to, I, I am interested in knowing if the United States is contributing or paying for any of the of the opposition delegation's expenses. I mean, I presume that they're not independently wealthy and, and aren't footing the bill themselves. So I will check and see if there's Even a, if it's a UN contribution to which the United States is contributing for it. I will check and Thank see you. what information we have on that. Go ahead, Liz. Jen, um, <clears throat> how do you see this proceeding? Was there another meeting in Switzerland today, including the, the US, to try to put pressure on the sides? Do you know of any other meeting going on? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Uh, obviously, there are many meetings in Switzerland that happen at any given time, given the UN has a base there. Um, and, you know, I will say that, um, that um, Secretary Kerry spoke with Foreign Minister Lavrov today. Uh, as he mentioned last week, we expect there will be many paths, uh, many parallel processes, uh, as we all work to pursue uh, an end to this conflict. And that means, yes, the, the regime and the opposition talking uh, through with Brahimi facilitating that process. That means engagement through the UN. That means uh, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov continuing to engage. Let me just give you a quick readout of that just before we uh, keep moving forward. Uh, on, uh, in, as a part of the discussion, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, pressed for uh, Russia's help in providing uh, humanitarian assistance and making progress on that. We talked a little bit of this about this two days ago. Obviously, there's st still more uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, just on that note, uh, there are 12 trucks waiting outside of homes with over 100 tons of food. These trucks are 100 yards away from people that are in desperate need of assistance, uh, and they must be granted permission by the regime into the old city of homes. He also talked about the importance of continuing to press the regime to move forward with uh, the necessary steps on, OP on uh, the, the chemical weapons process, um, and they briefly, very briefly, touched base on coordination on the Olympics. It was mainly focused on Syria. At the same time, and this is not a Geneva meeting, but just to further make the point, Under Secretary Sherman is in Moscow right now for meetings with the political directors of the G8. Uh, in addition, she's also meeting with other Russian officials to discuss Geneva II and the situation in Syria. So obviously there are many engagements happening at one time uh, with the appropriate counterparts uh, in engaging on how we can best work together to move the process forward. Do you know how quickly they're going to come back together again? Is there any sort of indication before this all breaks up and mm -hmm. everyone goes in a different direction and it all gets forgotten, any kind of sort of idea of how soon they can get back together? Well, that certainly is a decision that uh, Joint Special Representative Brahimi would make. I think from the beginning he expected that at a certain point they would uh, part ways and they would uh, plan a time to come back. So we defer to him on whether that's next week or three weeks or next month, uh, but that's something obviously that he'll determine. And then um, we have sources um, in The Hague telling us that Syria has given up less than 5% of its chemical weapons um, arsenal and will miss next week's deadline um, uh, you know, that, that was set. Um, it's not enough and there is no sign of more, the source said. Um, what is, is this true and um, what is, is there anything being undertaken to step that up? Uh, I don't have any independent confirmation of the facts of the 5%. I did see your story. Um, I'd, of, of course, encourage you to check with OPCW, and we can then, on our end, follow up and see if there's more we can convey. Obviously, moving forward with this on an, uh, on an uh, expedited path, uh, as in, you know, because the, the, the 
uh, goals are so aggressive is a priority. That's one of the reasons the Secretary mentioned it to Foreign Minister Lavrov today, uh, and we, we bring that up in, in various channels. Can I ask you on the, um, uh, the trucks that are waiting outside homes with mm -hmm. 100 tonnes of food? Um, is, it, is it food? What, what's your understanding of what's actually in there? Is it uh, I, uh, my understanding is it's over 100 tonnes of food. I can check if there's other, uh, uh, other provisions that are included Would in the Would it truck. be um, non-perishables, presumably? Um, I'd have to check on that level of, of specificity. And what's the, mm -hmm. do you, what is your understanding about what the whole, where the holdup is in, get, in getting the trucks inside? Uh, well, I think uh, we talked about this a little bit on on Monday, and not much has changed in the sense that uh, the proposal has been the evacuation of women and children. Uh, our view and the view of the opposition and many in the international community is, of course, that's not acceptable. That doesn't pass the bar. An evacuation is not uh, an alternative to badly needed humanitarian assistance. Uh, and you know the the reason uh, the reason that this hasn't gone through just logistically is that the regime has not let the convoy through. So that's a step that we believe needs to be taken. So okay. on, on this very point, I mean, just going back to Matt's mm -hmm. question on this, if, if these talks have not produced even uh, uh, something like allowing the trucks in, what, what really, what use have they served? Well, so as, I, as I said, when Matt asked the question, Saeed, right. let's right. not re forget yeah, that just two, let to me the, finish to my trucks. answer. Yeah. Just two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, the regime and the opposition had not sat uh, at the same table. Uh, they were certainly not discussing humanitarian access. They were certainly not discussing uh, the Geneva communique and the creation of a transitional governing body. Those discussions are on the table. That is an important step in our view. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, but uh, but that is where we are, and it's it's farther than we were two weeks ago. Okay. So, but going back to the talks, you do expect these talks to to resume in about a week or ten days. I don't weeks? have any prediction of the timing. Uh, Joint Special Representative Brahimi would make an announcement and a decision, a decision and then an announcement about that. Uh, but that is my understanding of the plans. At some point, they would resume. Do you really your response was that you did say next week or next month, but bearing in mind that next week is next month. Are you saying that oh, it's possible how trickery. that... trickery. No, well, I'm just wondering. I mean, you're, you're suggesting that, that they, they might not meet again until March? I, I, was, I, was, I was using a... I was using a broad uh, reference to I'm not sure how long it will be. It could be in a week. It could be in later in the month. Uh, but I don't right. have it, an exact date for all of But it is you. your expectation that they will, after they break on Friday, they will meet again in February, not the month after. Right. I don't have any expect. I don't okay. have any prediction of that because that's and not then, for us to. Determine. Well, isn't there a, just just quick sure. point, Matt? Isn't there a kind of um, date yet determined? Not yet determined, but um, thinking that there would be another kind of major meeting in March, though, and you're uh, saying this could be a a pre-meeting or a, another. No, I don't want to get overly complicated here. The only thing I was trying to do is prevent announcing a decision that I'm not sure if it's been made yet that Joint Special Representative Brahimi will make. They will reconvene. I don't have a date for when that will be. And then uh, just on the other thing, and I'll allow two other th brief, very brief things on the left. When you said that he, he, he was looking for Russian help to provide humanitarian assistance, you're, you're, you're meaning pressing Russian the help and pushing the regime. Correct. You're not looking for Russian contribution. No, no, no. To, okay. We're pressing the regime. And then lastly, you said they touched briefly on Olympic coordination. Can you be more specific? Is that security coordination? Is that, like, I don't know, helping people get through airport It's security or coordination. As you know, Russia has the lead, but we've uh, been uh, offered assistance, and we've been closely coordinating with them. And to the best of your knowledge, have they accepted the assistance or, or uh, asked for any? I don't have any update on that. That was just an issue that was briefly <coughs> raised on the call. Going back to <coughs> Syria and uh, Brahimi, mm -hmm. do you have the confidence that uh, Mr. Brahimi has the acumen and the capability to continue to conduct these talks between the two sides in a, in a fashion that can produce results? We do. Mm -hmm. and, Syria? And how, do you, how do you measure what he has done so far since he took over? from his predecessor, Kofi Annan. I, I don't have a measurement or a grade. I think what's important to note here is that uh, he has facilitated uh, the talks for the last several days. Uh, they've talked about some important issues. He's acknowledged very clearly there's more work to be done, and we all expected that it would take some time to move Despite this Despite the fact that each side accusing him of just parroting out the, the other side's point of view. Well, uh, these are obviously <laughs> tough discussions, and. Uh, he's right in the middle of them. Okay, so. let, me, let me ask you about uh, the aid that you resumed 
uh, last week to st certain <coughs> groups and so on. Could you uh, sort of shed light on that? Sure. Um, so uh, we um, hope to be able to resume. We have resumed non-lethal uh, assistance. We hope to re be able to resume assistance to the SMC shortly pending security and logistics uh, considerations. I don't have an update on that uh, for you today, but that is uh, where we stand in terms of uh, what we've been able to resume. Let me just see if I have anything further for all of you here on this particular question. <clears throat> what about these reports that the um, that you're passing small arms and um, uh, anti mine tanks to the uh, to the rebels through Jordan as a part of a, a defense appropriation? Uh, I don't have anything uh, for you on that. Um, I can just tell you what we've uh, resumed, what I'm able to discuss. So are you supplying small arms or training any any moderate groups in Jordan? I don't have anything for you on that, just as I never have in eight months. Can I just clarify? Sorry, you mm -hmm. said we've resumed non-lethal aid, and then you say let me, let me we want to resume out, assistance. Let me spell it out a little bit more for you, uh, Joe, here. I just wanted to get a detail of what specifically was resuming. Um, <clears throat> Is it where the aid was stopped because of the looting of the warehouses? That's right. That's where um, that's where the uh, assistance was uh, put on hold. Um, uh, so in late December, we resumed deliveries of non-lethal assistance into northern Syria to civilian actors inside Syria. Uh, these unarmed, um, unarmed actors inside Syria to whom non-lethal assistance has been resumed include local and provincial councils and civil society groups. Uh, these deli deliveries are helping those local groups provide essential services for the Syrian people and counter violent, violent extremists. Deliveries to unarmed actors include ambulances, garbage trucks, big generators, food baskets, school supplies, office equipment, as well as assistance uh, to police. Uh, separately, the assistance, uh, which has also been a question uh, on to the SMC, we hope to uh, resume soon. Do you know what, just to, to maybe mm -hmm. just you know, close a circle. Sure. Do you know what happened to all that aid that was looted from the warehouses? You were calling for it to come back at one point. Have you seen sight nor hair of it since? Uh, I believe uh, the vast majority has been returned. I don't have any other specific update. I will see if there's anything more we can outline for all of you. Go ahead. Uh, what role the U.S. Uh, delegation is, uh, has been playing in uh, Geneva? This, the which delegation? The U.S. Oh, uh, well, Ambassador Ford has, of course, and his team have been on the ground. Uh, they've been in very close contact with the opposition. Uh, they've been meeting with them regularly. Um, and they've been there uh, uh, as a kind of an outside advisor to the opposition. But the talks between the opposition and the regime are uh, being run by Joint Special Representative Brahimi, and we expect that will continue. And what can you say about the cooperation between the Russians and the Americans in Geneva uh, during these negotiations? Uh, well, I would just say that uh, obviously I, I don't I don't have the details of who the Russians have on the ground who, if they have anyone on the ground. Uh, I can speak to who we have the, on the ground, uh, and there are several layers of cooperation and coordination on this uh, with the Russians, including uh, the the conversations I mentioned that Under Secretary Sherman is having as a part of the G8 discussions. Secretary Kerry speaking with Foreign Minister Lavrov. So uh, we've remained in touch through that uh, through that channel. Uh, deputy, uh, uh, Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister uh, has called Ambassador for today the guidance or the spiritual leader for Al-Qaeda in, uh, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, what do you think about this uh, name? Uh, I haven't seen those specific comments, but obviously we would refute uh, the absurdity of that claim. Uh, we have uh, done nothing but uh, support uh, the opposition. You heard the President say, uh, even in his State of the Union last night uh, that we would uh, express his opposition to extremist elements uh, in in Syria. So that notion we'd certainly refute, but I haven't seen those specific that, comments or the context. Last one. Uh, there are talks about the biological uh, weapons in Syria now. Can you uh, elaborate on that? I haven't seen those reports, so I don't have any confirmation or, or comment on them. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, on Syria, mm -hmm. the foreign minister, uh, Iranian foreign minister Zarif, mm -hmm. uh, called on all foreign elements that are fighting in Syria to pull out of Syria. Do you see this as a good sign, and will you hold them to task on this issue? Well, I mean, uh, you know, that's assuming that they have, they can have uh, the part to sort of uh, pressure or force or ask or request Hezbollah to leave. 
Well, as you know, we've long called for all foreign fighters and foreign elements to depart from Syria. So certainly if that were to happen, we'd see that as a positive development. But as always, actions speak louder than words. And, uh, you know, if that's a step that's taken, I, I can assure you we'd see that as a positive step. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I wonder if there's some disappointment about how little mention there was in Syria, of Syria last night in the uh, President's address. I think there was a little bit about extremist elements and then one line about we're going to work about with the international community for uh, the future that Syrians deserve. Considering this has been described as the greatest humanitarian crisis uh, presented before the world at the moment, I thought his, his thoughts on Syria were a little sparse. Well, I would... Uh, you know, I worked for the president for a long time, and I think the secretary's been in this town a long time, and I can assure you that nobody is counting the words in the State of the Union as an evaluation or as a, um, as a um, uh, I guess evaluation is the right word, of, of how important an issue is. Uh, obviously, there's competition for how many words are used for each issue, but uh, what the evidence of the commitment is the fact that uh, we were just in Geneva, how committed we are to uh, supporting the opposition. Uh, that's an issue that the Secretary closely coordinates and works obviously closely with the White House on, and that's where our focus is and not how many words may or may not have been dedicated to an issue. Uh, just let me say how sure. surprised I am that you didn't, <coughs> you, you, you did not express pro the profound disappointment that this building has with the speech of your, of your boss. You are? That that's you're, good. I'm glad that you want to keep your job. <laughs> Can we move to the I have a little more in Syria. Oh, a little sorry. more in Syria? Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Um, I, uh, the ODNI today released its worldwide threat assessment, um, and there was a few sentences on Syria in the Russia section saying that Moscow has hailed its CW initiative in Syria as a major foreign policy accomplishment, that it positions Russia to play a major role in any future settlement of the Syrian conflict, and adds legitimacy to the Syrian regime. Does the State Department agree with that? Uh, I certainly don't think we view any step as adding legitimacy to the regime. We do think that getting chemical weapons out of Syria, as we've said many times, would certainly be a positive step. And as to what it would mean for Russia, I will leave that to uh, global political analyst, analysts to, to consider. Excuse me. You would uh, stop short of saying that it adds legitimacy to the Syrian regime. I, I would not. I think obviously the removal of chemical weapons, the work the OPCW is doing, the work the UN is doing, uh, are positive steps we certainly support. But uh, obviously the fact that these were used to begin with uh, remains a, uh, a a jarring reminder of the brutality happening in the country. So if I if I remember correctly, and and please correct me if sure. I'm, if I'm wrong, um, that it was the. Um, administration stance that it didn't have to be the Assad regime who is responsible for getting all chemical weapons out of Syria. That's that if right. a transitional government would take place, that that could be done by them mm -hmm. as well, whoever that may be. Is That's that right. still That's the right. case? Mm -hmm. okay. That remains the case. Right. Do you Thank have any you. more in Syria? Saeed, on Syria? Yeah, no. Oh. Oh, okay, well, let's move on to Scott, because sure, you've sure. asked a few questions. On Ukraine. Sure. Uh, the president last night spoke more broadly about his goals for Ukraine, but what are your thoughts more specifically on the resignation of the government there? Sure. Uh, well, let me just give you uh, a couple of updates on where things stand. And you may have seen this, Scott, but for those of you who aren't following this every moment, uh, yesterday or two days ago, uh, we uh, encouraged, uh, we were, we expressed our, uh, the fact that we were encouraged that Ukraine's parliament repealed the most egregious of the anti democratic laws. Uh, today, we want to urge President Yanukovych to sign the repeal laws. Uh, that obviously is the only step that would would change the course of that. Vice President Biden has also spoken uh, with President Yanukovych now three times. There was a readout you may have seen that the White House put out yesterday. Uh, and during that call, he expressed um, uh, to President Yanukovych uh, the importance of working with the opposition to take additional concrete steps to reach a peaceful solution to the political crisis, such as passing an amnesty law and creating a government uh, of political unity. Um, you know, in terms of the specific resignation, and there was another, uh, you know, there was other issues of, of, of that uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we have urged the Ukrainian government and the opposition to ensure that the new government is one that fosters political unity, economic health supported by the IMF, and meets the Ukrainian people's aspirations for a European future. It's never been about one person. It's been about uh, all of these issues that Vice President Biden expressed are important to move forward on uh, uh, as the government uh, looks to what they should do next. Uh, so that's that's our view of where things stand now. Can I just follow up on sure. That? 
The former uh, president today um, described the situation in the Ukraine as being on the brink of civil war. Is that an assessment that you would agree with in this building? Uh, I have not heard that specific assessment. Uh, I believe what, what, what our view is is that we're concerned, of course, uh, not only about any incidents of violence, as we've expressed repeatedly, but about uh, the crackdown that's occurred and the unwillingness to uh, allow the voices of the people of Ukraine to be heard. Uh, so that's how we would characterize it. We are encouraged by uh, the dialogue between the opposition and the, uh, and the government. Um, and uh, we continue to press uh, for, uh, for, the new, for a go new government that can strengthen democratic institutions and make the reforms necessary for economic prosperity, which is ultimately where we started this conversation, which was how Ukraine can reach, uh, can, can move forward on the best path. How many people have, you, have the U.S. Um, slept with a visa ban? In Ukrainians. the world, <laughs> the Ukrainians. We're on Ukraine. <laughs> well, uh, I don't. I, I actually don't believe that's a, a specific number we would provide. I can check back with our consular team and see if that's information we would, well, in this case, be. Reports here today that um, the Interior Minister and top national security official are among those, and um, was wondering if you could at least just give us some kind of insight as to, you know, who's involved and who's who's been affected or just even a number? Well, my recollection is that visa applications in the process is confidential. Is uh, part of this shaming them that they can't come to the United States? I mean, not just the pleasure of coming to this great country, but isn't it um, part of, of slapping them with a visa ban is the international shame of not being able to travel here? I wouldn't characterize it in that way. Obviously, there's a range of criteria that goes into uh, why, whether a visa application is accepted or denied. I don't have any details on this specifically, so I can't even speak to uh, whether that's an action that's been taken. Um, is, so you've, you've, um, the U.S. has already taken this one step. Is the U.S. looking at any other sanctions that could be applied if, this, if the government just, uh, if things get out of hand? Well, we've said we've been willing to consider. We haven't said that we are considering. We haven't said that any decision has been made. So that's where, uh, where we stand at this point, and that hasn't changed. You, any more on Ukraine? Okay. Palestinian uh, Israeli Sure. Uh, could you update us on what is going on with the Palestinian negotiator meetings here? Mm -hmm. They are in progress, where we are in the talk. What is the likelihood of Secretary Kerry going, you know, uh, on his trip going to Ramallah and Jerusalem? Sure. Uh, yeah. There's no plans to travel uh, next week. Uh, I just announced what our trip is. I don't expect that will change. Uh, the Secretary has said that uh, when it is uh, useful for him to return to the region, he is happy to do that. As you know and as you noted, the Israeli negotiators were here last week. Uh, the Palestinian negotiators were here this week. Uh, we felt it was an appropriate time, given there's a discussion about a framework for negotiations, to touch base with each side, see if we can continue to bridge the gap uh, between the parties. So that was what the focus of the discussion has been on. I'm not sure today, and I'm happy to check at what point the conversation concluded, um, but uh, that's where we stand, and that's why they were in town. Uh, is there any likelihood that the Secretary may announce his framework agreement or proposal for agreement, let's say, early next month? I'm not going to give you a prediction of uh, what a timing would be. Obviously, what we're focused on now is uh, bridging the gaps and uh, moving towards, uh, towards uh, making sure the ideas and the proposals from both sides are incorporated and uh, seeing if we can come up with a framework for negotiation. So I'm certainly not going to make a prediction of when that would be concluded. Let me rephrase my question. Okay. Uh, should we expect that once the Secretary decides that it is time to announce this framework agreement, that he will announce it like in a press conference or in a big forum or you know, in, in, a, in a way that resonates in the world? So I'm going to just knock on wood now for you, uh, for me. Um, I don't have any prediction of the communications rollout uh, for a framework that doesn't uh, yet exist. So. And, and you are not aware of any other, let's say, American-Palestinian track other than Syed Barakat? And, uh, he was you, here. That's what the negotiations were. Obviously, yeah. uh, Ambassador Indyk and, and uh, his deputy, Frank Lowenstein, are also in touch with counterparts, and, and uh, C.G. Ratney is in touch with counterparts. So uh, as with any issue, there's multiple conversations happening. And you feel that the Palestinians are 
being flexible enough on the issues that you want them to be flexible on, such as, you know, perhaps recognizing the Israel as a Jewish state and relenting on the issue of the refugees? Well, I don't have any prediction of the outcome here, Saeed, but uh, obviously these are tough issues. Uh, they're politically charged issues with decades of history, uh, and that's uh, why we didn't expect this to be an easy process. More, more than decades. Sorry, this more than decades. Several thousand years. You're, you're becoming a very <laughs> mathematically focused human Sorry. today. <laughs> Afghanistan? Afghanistan? Sure. I wondered um, what, the, what your comment was on the reports in the Washington Post yesterday citing Afghan officials in which they say that President Karzai believes the United States may have backed some of the attacks against, um, the, some of the insurgent attacks to undermine his government. Well, I think in that same story, Ambassador Cunningham and General Dunford were both quoted. So, um, you know, and they were very clear. So I would echo what they said, which is that uh, we have spent 12 years trying to br bring peace and stability to Afghanistan in the face of threats from terrorist and insurgent networks. To suggest otherwise does a grave disservice to those who have sacrificed for the people of Afghanistan. Further, it flies in the face of logic and morality to think that we would aid the enemy that we're trying to defeat. And we are trying to get a BSA signed uh, to continue to defeat. Uh, so. Generally, about relations between the United States and uh, Karzai in particular, actually. I, I think, look, the, the United States and President Karzai uh, both have a, a similar goal, uh, which is to achieve a stable, sovereign, unified Afghanistan, responsible for its own security and able to ensure that it can never again be a safe haven for terrorists. Uh, it's not about trust. It's not about other issues than the fact that moving forward on a BSA, moving forward on, on, on getting that signed is in the best interest of the Afghan people, about, in the government, of the United States, of our NATO allies. Um, that's why we're focused on it. It's not about trust. What, what do you mean by it's not about trust? Well, what I mean is I think you're asking me about comments and what that says and what it means. And I think uh, I, would, I would just reiterate the fact that it doesn't change our commitment and desire to get the BSA signed. But if you have an interlocutor who's saying things like this, which you say do a grave disservice to the troops that you've had out in Afghanistan for the last 12 years. How can you have confidence that he will negotiate with you a BSA agreement, or even, so, well, it's negotiated, sign it with you, which will then um, guarantee the safety of your forces going forward? Well, President Karzai is the elected leader of Afghanistan. It still remains up to him to sign the BSA. That hasn't changed. We've talked about the reasons why we think that is important uh, and the reasons why it's in the interests of the Afghan people and the United States. So what I mean is that's what our focus is on, not what comments mean or what they, uh, what we should take from them. Well, can I, just say, I mean, are you convinced or do you, uh, do you know, has President Karzai made these allegations to U.S. officials that you're aware of? Uh, we've seen, obviously, the public comments. I don't have anything on the pub private public. comments. So as far as, as far as you know, you, you can't confirm you don't know firsthand that what the Post says that Karzai told other people is correct. Is that is that right? I think that's a fair point. Obviously, there are comments that have been made in the past that you could categorize in the same category. Right, but, but I mean, in terms of this specific story, where well, the question is, how what does this this say about the state of relations between the U.S. and Afghanistan, or the U.S. and, and Karzai? And I, I'm hard, I'm trying to figure out what you understand this to mean the story in the post or the comments that that you may or may not know are accurate that Karzai well, has Well, I was made. asked about the reported comments. As I understood Joe's question, it was more about a larger pattern. So that's how I was answering it. Okay. So you then would agree that there is a large, that, that, that whether or not these latest comment, reported comments from Karzai are actually correct, whether he said them or not, there is a existing history of comments in a similar vein that disturb you and that and that uh, would uh, that lead you to repeat the uh, ambassador Cunningham and um, and the general's well the response. comments that ambassador Cunningham and general Dunford made that I was reiterating were related to this specific set of comments that were I understand. reported in the post but did they do they or do you have any reason to believe that the reported comments in the story that they, they were actually made did, did, or are you saying you don't know, but that he has said things like this in the past, and so you have no reason to doubt the report? 
I, I, I'm just I was, trying to figure I was, out what it is. I'm that... not trying to overcomplicate this. All I was conveying was the reported comments in the story uh, that those raised concerns. Those concerns have been expressed from RN by Ambassador Cunningham and General Dunford. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to make a larger point here other than to respond to those specific okay. comments. The, the point is that, that oftentimes when you are asked about reported comments, mm -hmm. you'll say, or whoever is standing at the podium, for years it's been the case that, well, I haven't seen those comments, so I don't, I don't know how to address them. The fact that you're willing to stand up there and repeat what, what Cunningham and the, and mm -hmm. the general said suggests that you have reason to believe that what Car that Karzai's allegations that, that he in fact made them. I wasn't I don't have any further information than what was provided in the story, has, Matt. Has the Afghan government in mm -hmm. whether it's Karzai himself or one of his aides communicated to the US government that this is how they see the situation that the US I has think been I just a answered that question that I, I don't not, have any but information respectfully, Let me it's just very complicated I don't have any information on an independent private conversation what I was speaking to was reported comments yeah. is President Karzai still uh, a partner for the US uh, he remains the president of uh, Afghanistan he remains the partner that needs to sign the BSA uh, and we share as I mentioned uh, some goals uh, about moving forward uh, towards a stable, sovereign Afghanistan. Yes, a rudimentary question on mm -hmm. the agreement. Uh, last the BSA night, the agreement? The, the, yeah, on the, yeah. Uh, last night the president said, if Afghanistan signs, if. Is it really that if he, is it really, uh, is there such a great doubt cast on the possibility that they may or may not sign that agreement? Well, uh, I think you would know if they had signed it or if they'd indicated a timeline of when they would sign it. It remains true that the delay in signing as we've said many times, negatively affects confidence in the region as well as our and our allies' ability to plan a potential follow-on mission. As we've said many times, uh, this, uh, this uh, means that uh, we would have to at some point begin the process of planning uh, for a zero option. So that hasn't changed. I think what the President was, uh, was stating in his speech last night is the reality, which is that it hasn't been signed yet. So you are really neutral on signing or not signing. I mean, they could sign it or leave it, right? No, I think I've been absolutely clear that we're not neutral, that we'd like to have it signed. What, what, Do we have any more in the, Afghanistan? To, to the, 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 like the, the kind of enthusiasm you're pushing for, mm -hmm. or something that comes with, if you don't sign, we will do this kind of a thing. It was absent. Uh, I think that, that we've that been very clear that if they don't sign the BSA, we'll have to initiate planning for a zero option. Well, can I, yeah. there any discussions within NATO about, mm -hmm. we realize that the end of 2014 is coming, mm -hmm. but we have this issue with the BSA and we're up against the clock. And I don't really know how NATO, how the kind of um, documents work or mm -hmm. treaties work or whatever, but in the UN Security Council, if you need a couple more months to kind of, you know what I mean, push, push this along, you can just extend it for a couple months while, you know, troop levels are worked out mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I'm wondering, are there any discussions within NATO to say, Listen, we know we have this kind of time crunch right here. Can we extend, you know, two, three months to, to give us all the time that we need? I'm obviously not going to speak on behalf of NATO. I think NATO has spoken publicly themselves about the need to get this done as quickly as possible because they need a BSA signed in order to move forward with a SOFA. In terms of what their planning would require or what space they have, I don't have any, uh, any particular intel on that piece. But, I mean, are you willing to consider... As, as a NATO member state mm -hmm. who has, you know, discussions with other mm -hmm. NATO member states, you know, an extension of the mission for just a couple of months to see if the new government, you know what I mean, so that this way you don't have this kind of time crunch between planning for withdrawal. An extension and, in what capacity? So I'm just trying to make that Like, clear. you know, okay, we said we're going to all withdraw bet bet at the end of 2014. Can we say we're all going to, you know, keep it till like March of 2015 so that you know, we know whether we have these couple of months to play with. I'm not aware of, of that as being an option under consideration. Any Afghanistan or something else? Change the subject. Okay, and then we'll go to you next. Okay, go ahead. Um, on North Korea, uh -huh. um, I think it was three weeks, two weeks ago, um, you, you, re re you repeated a offer to send Ambassador King to mm -hmm. North Korea to discuss um, Mr. Bay's release. Um, have uh, the North Koreans come back to you in any way to accept that or, or not? Well, uh, we remain uh, prepared to send uh, Ambassador King to North Korea in support of Mr. Bay's release if North Korea re reinstates the invitation. 
uh, which they withdrew at the last moment in late August, as you as you well know. Uh, we do have a direct means of communicating with the North Koreans, as you probably know as well. And our focus at this point is on uh, whatever step we can take to uh, secure Kenneth Bay's release, which also means that we're not going to outline uh, any uh, details of interaction or every detail of what is or isn't discussed. Um, so that's where we stand, but we continue to press on it. There isn't a plan right now uh, for, for Ambassador King to travel there. And by direct, direct means, you do not mean Dennis Rodman, correct? Correct. He is not our, uh, our ambassador of choice. When Mr. Bay appeared in fr uh, front of TV cameras mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, that, this, that uh, a U.S. official said that um, I understand it was a new invite, but yeah. perhaps it was a repeat, um, that they were ready to send somebody and sure. that they were waiting. So no, no, no word from... I Mr. don't have any Sarah. update for you, I think is the best and way to tell you. Mm -hmm. just, uh, I'm sorry, I'm confused. They withdrew. He was going to go when? August. Came? And just before he went... They withdrew the invitation. Right. Since August, you guys have continually said the invit you've continually said you're prepared to send him. Is that Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. What can oh. you tell us about the secretary's visit with the Bay family yesterday? Uh, sure. Well, I know we sent out a little bit of a readout, but let me uh, reiterate that and then see what questions you have. Uh, so, Secretary Kerry met yesterday with the family of Kenneth Bay. Uh, he expressed his full support for the efforts of the family to bring Kenneth Bay home and said the department would continue its efforts to help. Uh, there's no greater priority for us than the welfare and safety of the United States, States citizens abroad, and he certainly reiterated that to the family. Uh, as you all know, Kenneth Bay has pub apologized publicly for actions that led to his April 30th, 2013 conviction. Uh, Mr. Bay's family has also apologized publicly on behalf of Kenneth Bay, and he reiterated the fact that we are continuing to urge North Korea to pardon uh, Kenneth Bay for his actions and grant him amnesty, uh, special amnesty, uh, and, and, and call for his immediate release. Uh, he, um, the family requested the meeting. Uh, Secretary, of course, was uh, happy to meet with them, uh, and this is uh, just uh, kind of shows you what a priority this is. Uh, we share the same goals, and that's, of course, what was discussed during the meeting. Um, but, um, you know, we, we agreed that out of respect for the family and our efforts to secure his release, we wouldn't get into too many details of what was discussed. Go ahead. Taiwan. Taiwan? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Um, so Robert King's visit, you, um, it's been, a, a, you know, in the months that have passed and you've continually re reiterated, mm -hmm. um, I guess North Korea's response has continuously been um, one of refusal. Is there any consideration to send someone else, someone higher profile, for instance, or with more of a visible kind of personage to North Korea instead? Not to that I'm aware of. I think we remain prepared to send uh, Ambassador King. And again, as I stated, just I, I'm not going to outline every interaction and every conversation that has had about this issue. On Taiwan. Okay. And Taiwan's leader, mind you, reiterated that the people on the both sides of Taiwan Strait belong to Chinese nation, Zhonghua Minzu. When he transited in Los Angeles yesterday, and in February, we will see a historic meeting in Nanjing of China between Taiwan's Minister of Mainland Affairs and the China's Director of Taiwan Affairs. And do you have any comments on that? I know you will say the U.S. policy has not changed one China policy, encouraging more dialogues. Oh, you're but doing my job for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering if the U.S. Uh, is happy to see more dialogues, more cross-trade dialogues, uh, not only uh, touches uh, economic issue, but also political issues. Uh, I think you restated what our position is uh, generally. Uh, I'm happy to check with our team and see if we have any particular view on this upcoming uh, meeting that you mentioned. South Sudan? Sure. Um, so today the South Sudanese have released seven of the 11 mm -hmm. detainees that have been held for a few weeks. Um, I wondered if you had a reaction to that. But alongside that, they've decided that uh, four of the remaining leaders, mm -hmm. uh, opposition leaders, are going to be put on trial for attempting... Uh, for att an attempted coup against President Keir. Uh, given that I think it was back at the beginning of the month, um, I think it was Assistant Secretary uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield mm -hmm. said that there was no evidence from the US 
side that this was an attempted coup. I wondered if you had a reaction for us. Uh, sure. Well, we, of course, welcome today's release uh, by the government of South Sudan of seven of 11 political detainees. Uh, this is an important step towards an inclusive political dialogue under the auspices of EGAD. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, four of the detainees remain detained, uh, so we urge the government of South Sudan to release the remaining four. Uh, last weekend, as you all know, there was a cessation of hostilities agreement signed that, of course, was a good step, uh, but more uh, needs to be done, uh, and we're encouraging that at this point. So, uh, you know, as South Sudan's leaders uh, continue to work to fully implement the agreement, we're encouraging them to focus on starting an inclusive political dialogue to resolve uh, the underlying causes of the of the conflict, uh, and that's uh, what our focus remains on uh, at this point. Um, in terms of, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, if you if you still have four of them in custody mm -hmm. facing charges, is that going to threaten the ceasefire, which has been sort of holding, but there's still fighting going on in parts? Well, I think it's more the challenge, It, the question of how would it impact um, the political dialogue, because some of these individuals are uh, players, and we've talked about this from the beginning, but who would be pivotal to that discussion. So. Uh, we've said from the beginning, and this is one of the arguments that we continue to make, that the full participation of all of the political uh, detainees is critical to a political dialogue. Uh, and as per the January 23rd agreement on the status of the detainees signed by the government and the opposition, uh, you know, the expeditious release of these detainees is critical to moving that piece forward. So that's where our focus is. South Sudan, or any more on that? Okay, on go ahead, topic, Catherine. Um, an Ecuador-related question. Mm -hmm. um, first, generally, I have a couple of specific questions, okay. but um, can you update us on the status of Roberto and William Isais? I know there had been some failed attempts at extradition mm -hmm. to Ecuador, and I believe they still have valid U.S. visas. Um, uh, I don't have any details uh, to provide on the validity of their visas. Uh, there is, there has been, as has been broadly reported, of course, in a back and forth on an extradition process. As you know, there are several uh, complicated procedures always involved in that. Um, so I don't have any particular update uh, for all of you on that today. Um, does the State Department agree with the position of past ambassadors to Ecuador, like Christy Kenny, that the Issa East brothers absconded with $100 million from their bank, um, basically that they're guilty of what Ecuador is saying they have done, and that the State Department wants to find a way to work with Ecuador? <coughs> or does the State Department share the view of Senator Menendez that the brothers are innocent and wrongly per persecuted by Ecuador? I don't have any evaluation from the podium about what we view of the charges, uh, our view of the charges. Obviously, there's an extradition request process in place. Uh, that's a complicated process, uh, one that is uh, by policy uh, confidential, so I don't have any other details on the status of it. Um, has Senator Menendez contacted the State Department in writing or in phone calls on behalf of the Isais brothers? And is that something that you typically see from a member of Congress? Uh, I, I'd have to check. Obviously, the Secretary speaks with him very regularly, given he's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I'm not aware if this issue has come up. I'm happy to check Thank if you. there's any more we can share on that point. Jen, I wanted to go back mm -hmm. to the President's address last sure. night, if I may. Um, it was, you know, despite being a, a major high-profile address, uh, approximately a quarter of which was donated, which was de de uh, devoted to foreign policy and mm -hmm. national security. Mm -hmm. I, there were only a few mentions of, of East Asia, and I wanted to ask you if that reflects something on the rebalance to Asia policy. Is that still a major pillar of the administration's foreign policy? Uh, absolutely. It remains a pillar. The fact that the Secretary is planning what I believe is his fourth trip, if my math is correct, but Mac will check me on the math here. I think it's fifth. Uh, the fifth trip, I'm sorry. Uh, soon. Uh, tells you uh, exactly what you need to know about how committed we are. Um, it's also a place where uh, Deputy Secretary Burns uh, recently visited, uh, where um, you know we remain committed to uh, working closely on all of the security and strategic and economic issues that that we've we've long had a dialogue on. And uh, you know there was one sentence on Ukraine, but that doesn't change how committed we are to that issue and how much time we focus on that issue, simply reflected by the fact that the Vice President has 
uh, has spoken with the president of Ukraine three times in, I think, the last week. Yeah. Uh, so I would caution anyone against evaluating word count as being equated with with importance. I understand, but the administration mm -hmm. also does doesn't have hasn't had a rebalance to Ukraine policy for the last six years. But <laughs> that's um, but leaving that aside. Um, that any, does is have a any... nice ring to it, though. It does. It does. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is there any I, I think let me just let me just reiterate. Let me just reiterate that uh, you know the United States, the President of the United States, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel could not be more committed to our relationship with Asia, how important the region is. Uh, the fact that it was mentioned in, in the State of the Union, which is the biggest speech of the year, is also evidence of how committed the administration is to that. Okay, thank you. And well, is there, is there you more? Know, as you will note from that question, your response to Joe's question before that people don't count words, I think that you'll find that the, in particular, in particular, the Japanese, South Koreans, the Chinese, and others do count the words and do, uh, and it does, it, it does make a, make a, it, it, it does make an impression when they are mentioned or not. Well, they must like you a lot. <laughs> a lot of words. I don't, they like, they like me about as much as you do, let's put it that way. Can I go back if we're done on sure. the Asia in the speech? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to your opening on, uh, second opening statement. On, on Egypt? Egypt, mm -hmm. yeah, which was really kind of was quite tough um, after, at least I think, some mm -hmm. relative period of, of, of almost silence on, uh, on the situation there, except for bending over backwards to say that you don't support this or that candidate to be I did for talk very briefly on Monday, very briefly, about our concern about the detainment of journalists. But um, Okay, well, this can was, I just ask mm -hmm. why today did you decide to really lower the boom with, you know, calling this egregious violations mm -hmm. and, and, and playing flat out wrong? What, what, what was it that prompted this... Uh, well, I think uh, this is an issue uh, anywhere in the world, but certainly in Egypt, as is applicable now, that uh, we have been concerned about the events building over the past several weeks. We felt it was important to highlight them and express our concern about the treatment of journalists and our belief that freedom of the media and freedom of press is something that should be respected and valued. So it was important for us to get that message out. Concerns about uh, the treatment of journalists extend beyond uh, just the treatment of journalists and freedom of freedom of the press? Are, are there other things in the second transition to democracy that you're concerned about in Egypt that you would care to speak so um, bluntly about well, today? Well, I think, I mean, I can outline what our concerns have been, if that's helpful, and we express those as they come what, up. Right, okay, so it's just, uh, um, we shouldn't read into this that Today, you're only concerned about the treatment of journalists. That is still not a what I was stating. Other, we were, I know, I know. But, yeah. I, but there's still a lot of other concerns that you Absolutely. do have about and what's going on. What we, what the, the reason that I did that at the top is because we felt strongly that this is an issue that should receive more attention and that uh, we've been especially concerned about in recent weeks. Journalists you, in particular or the crackdown of all in democratic institutions, well, including political opposition, but to be fair, we express the concern about crackdown and have on a number of occasions. This has been, there have been recent arrests of journalists and treatment of journalists that we just wanted to highlight. That's the reason that I raised it. So do you regard this as not as backsliding in more than just an area, this particular area today? That, that you, you're seeing Egypt right now in the, going in the wrong direction, is that correct? Well, certainly the detainment of journalists and the treatment uh, is, is something that we were concerned enough about to raise it. Uh, raise it here publicly. But does this usher in, your, in your blunt language, mm -hmm. does this usher in a new era of, or a new attitude towards the government of Egypt that it will be held accountable and not get a pass? I mean, to use my word, the other day. I don't you know, think anybody is. thinks they're getting a pass. Yeah. I think we so express. They, they thought so. I think, I think, we think ex they did. Let me finish. Yeah. Yeah. We express concerns when we have them. We highlight uh, events that are happening when we uh, see there's a reason to do that. and. And this was an example of that. And how would yeah. this be translated on the ground, let's say, in terms of reassuring all opposition, including the Muslim Brotherhood, that they can be part of a, a political process in the future and the United States will stand on its principle towards you know, the, uh, the right of the opposition to be a part of any political I future. think we've talked about inclusivity quite a bit. I was just highlighting uh, the treatment of journalists because we, we felt it was important to, uh, to shine a light on how concerned we were about that. On Last Japan. one. On Japan. 
<laughs> and uh, the spokeswoman of Chinese Foreign Ministry, uh, Hua Chunying, today asked for Japanese Prime Minister Abe not to play trick of calling for an Asia summit, but taking their actions to improve its relationship with its neighbors. And yesterday you said that uh, the reporting of the Wall Street Journal about the uh, U.S. seeking uh, mm -hmm. for private assurance is not accurate. But what is the accurate message that the United States sent to the Japanese government? Thank you. Well, uh, I think if I'm answering your question here, yesterday you, there was a question very specifically about a report saying we'd ask for private assurances. So that's what I was addressing. In general, uh, we communicate and we convey to the Japanese government, just like we convey to, uh, to other governments in the region, whether that's South Korea or China, that we think that there's an importance, uh, uh, we think there should be an increased focus on dialogue, and uh, we continue to encourage that, and we continue to discourage uh, actions that would cause tensions in the region. So that's the message we would have to any of those countries. Uh, I have Joe? one more. Okay, go ahead. On Justin Bieber. Oh, not what I expected. No. <laughs> I like to bring up a the good unexpected. way to finish the briefing. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> there is, on the White House website, there okay. is a petition which has passed a hundred thousand signatures to deport Justin Bieber for his actions um, for driving illegal drag racing in, Mi in Miami and so on and so forth. My question is: um, Would this, if he's found guilty, would this actually violate his visa, and could he be deported? Uh, well, there's a couple questions in there. So in the question of what would violate his visa, I would have anyone's visa. I will check and see what is publicly available information on that. Uh, I think what you're referring to is this, uh, this wonderful program that the White House started that allows people to uh, raise signatures for a variety of issues, whether that's health care for children or perhaps it can be uh, issues that you just mentioned here today. Uh, I think uh, that's an action that I would point you to the White House on, on what steps they may or may not take. It doesn't always determine a step will be taken. It's more of a, another opportunity for the voices of the They're American revoking people a visa to come under you. Yeah. That is true, but that's a separate yeah. question, and I'll see if there's criteria that's publicly available in terms of what how that would apply to or any or anyone. Or precedent for such type of... We will see what is available. Elise well, is smiling because <laughs> she's so excited is right it, now. It, is, it, <laughs> is it actually something that you are involved in the decision-making of? You would, the Justice Department would be involved in deciding whether it should be revoked, and then you would just stamp canceled or something on it, right? I mean, is the State Department involved? in considering deportation cases, or is that purely a uh, function of law enforcement? Well, uh, we're getting down quite a rabbit hole here with Justin Bieber, but... Well, <laughs> I, I, on, on anyone. I just, I, I'm just wondering if this is the right place to be asking a question about that, because I, I'm not sure that you guys do. That is a fair but, point. I was trying to give a serious answer right. on, uh, I will check and see what, what is, the visa implications would be for anybody who is found of, yeah. of uh, possibly but violating as, the But law. as long as we're on celebrities, do mm -hmm. you have you taken any note at all about this controversy involving Scarlett Johansson and this Super Bowl ad for Soda Stream, the Israeli company? Have you is this on your radar? I at all? have not seen this. Um, I have to. I'll talk to you about it. Read my People magazine more. No, no, no. It's not, no, it's actual <laughs> real news. I, I I've not seen the report to answer your question.